Hey guys, it's Jacob from Living Healthy Every Day, and we've got a cool podcast for you today. Today, we're going to be discussing mitochondria. So I'm here with Dr. Peter Bongiorno. Thanks for being here, Peter. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Peter is a naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist and the medical director at Inner Source Health. And he's currently changing the way we think about fixing the cause of problems instead of just treating symptoms. He's also worked as a researcher for NIH and Yale University and has co-authored numerous medical journals in the field of neuroendocrinology. So let's, let's discuss a little bit about the problem with the medical system now. Um, what, what's wrong with it? Why, why are we not actually seeing better, uh, better symptoms, people getting better? Well, I mean... You know, let's start with what's, I think, strong about the medical system. You know, when it comes to uh, urgent care situations and acute conditions, you know, like I tell my patients, if you get hit by a bus and a limb is falling off or something awful like that, conventional medicine can be amazing and can absolutely save lives, you know. Yeah. Um, if you have a terrible bacterial infection that years ago used to kill people, you take a pill and, and the, an antibiotic or something like similar, and it goes away, right? And, and that's kind of magical for very emergency care situations that people used to die from years ago. So I think we definitely have a, you know, so there is something very good about conventional care. The problem is uh, conventional care looks at every disease uh, sort of similarly. It's kind of like you throw a pill at it and make the symptom go away. Yeah. And that works for infectious disease, but unfortunately, it doesn't work for all the chronic diseases that really plague our society today. And, and that's the issue, because when you know things like antibiotics came out uh, many decades ago, uh, they miraculously saved lives that would have been lost with a pill. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, conventional medicine is still looking at disease the same way as if you could take a pill and make it go away. Unfortunately, you can't. What many of these pills can do is cover up symptoms. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the analogy I use is, you know, when you're driving down the highway and the oil light comes on, it's a big red light and sometimes it can blare in your eye. You can cover it up with a piece of electric tape, <laughs> but not necessarily the best thing in the long run. And that's exactly what we're doing yeah, in conventional long, care when it comes to chronic diseases we have we're covering up the symptoms we're not fixing the problems and 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 the body is getting more unhealthy in the process and oftentimes the drugs themselves can be quite toxic and cause even more problems and and that's really the issue um i think if we could marry what's best about conventional care especially with urgent and emergency care situations with what, what is best of, about naturopathic medicine and natural medicine and holistic thinking, then we'd have a system that could do the best job possible. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, you've got the conventional medicine that's really good for life-saving immediate things like that. And then, yeah, really got to treat the, the cause of what's going on, fixing it in the long term, which is nice. Nice to hear that there's people like you spreading the word out there like that. So what is the, the root cause of all disease, or where does it all stem from? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, I, you know, I think there's not one cause of disease. I think there are multiple causes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, when we think about it, um, there's genetic predisposition, certainly, um, and then there's lifestyle and environmental uh, factors that also play a role. Yeah. Um, one of the areas I've been working on in-depthly when I think about the root cause, you know, because when I went to naturopathic school, it's a four-year medical program, and in that school, you learn uh, equivalent to what regular medical doctors learn, but at the same time, they really teach you to start thinking about the underlying causes of disease at the same time. Yeah. So, um, so as I've been uh, in my practice for the last 13 years, I've been thinking about, well, you know, helping people with sleep, helping people with diet, helping people to exercise, uh, taking the right nutrients, you know, checking in with their digestive function. Yeah. And one of the, um, pieces that keep coming up for me over and over was actually this idea of mitochondrial health. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, probably about seven or eight years ago, I saw a patient, um, a, a younger guy, probably in his late 20s, and um, and they thought he was depressed, and they thought he had chronic fatigue, and um, and a lot of his symptoms just didn't match up, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, um, and looking into it further, what I found is that he had this very uh, subclinical mitochondrial deficit, where certain laboratory tests came up off a little bit and we started working on his mitochondrial health and i saw him for, get better and better terms, whereas you know for the past 10 years for layman's terms what is i'm sorry what's that for layman's terms what is mitochondria oh, yeah. Yeah. so the mitochondria and probably a lot of people have heard the word right we've mm-hmm. all learned in high school and the and the phrase that we all learn is that it's the pus of the cell you know the and that's what the mitochondria yeah. is the mitochondria is is the is the part of the cell that takes that makes energy that makes our energy that we need to run our body that we need to run our nervous system that we need to run our muscles um, and that allows us to do the things we do. Mm-hmm. So those those powerhouses. It's interesting because uh, you know millions of years ago we had these little cells which didn't have mitochondria and. And the mitochondria were separate entities, separate organisms, that um, what happened was they basically met the mitochondria, went into these single cells, what they called eukaryotic cells, and they created this relationship where the mitochondria would would bring more energy for the cell, and the cell would kind of take care of the mitochondria and get rid of its junk and, and also give it nutrients. Yeah. And um, and that's what happened. And over the years, um, you know, the cell was able to grow into more and more and more cells as a result because it had so much more energy to work with. Mm-hmm. And uh, so today, you know, our bodies have, you know, infinitesimal numbers of cells in there. And we have probably 10 times the amount of mitochondria. <laughs> so... Uh, so it's, uh, we have even more mitochondria than cells, and those mitochondria are responsible for creating all the energy that our cells and our bodies use every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's what's the the process of of creating energy for this mitochondria? Um, well, what the mitochondria do is they basically take um, sugar, like glucose, yeah, like one molecule of sugar, glucose, right? And they break it up into energy. So before we, ha- before mitochondria, our, our cells by themselves can take a molecule of glucose and take and make two units of energy, what they call ATP, right? And with mitochondria, we can make thirty. Yeah, thirty-eight. So it's yeah. a lot more energy. Yeah, thirty-eight. Though it's a lot more energy in, in total that we can make with mitochondria than with without. Uh, what happens is when the mitochondria aren't doing well and, and they're not making the energy they need to, we have to rely on the cell to do what it can do by itself, which is much, much less. Yeah. So let's get back to the, the story you had before. Uh, you were a patient with chronic fatigue or di- diagnosed with chronic fatigue and you saw some abnormal results. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what happened there? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. So, yeah. So what happened was uh, you know, because a lot of things didn't really add up. You know, he had some digestive issues. Um, he had some, uh, you know, sleeping problems, and, and we worked on those. And yet, the the fatigue and and uh, what seemed what people were calling depression persisted. And uh, and after running some uh, basic blood work and look at his adrenal function, we found his adrenal function was very low. And some of the blood work showed that, that the markers of mitochondria, this one called lactic acid, was quite, quite high. Mm-hmm. Um, and his coenzyme Q10 was actually quite, quite high, which usually means that the mitochondria, and he wasn't taking any. Yeah. So that usually means that the mitochondria aren't strong and that they're kind of breaking up. Was and his pyruvic a, acid. Was he on a statin? Because statins are no, usually cause no, low CoQ10. That's it. A really great question because statin can lower co- yeah. CoQ10 as well. In fact, in all other countries, most uh, doctors usually will give CoQ10 when they give statin. Yeah. But no, he that. Um, and he also had, interestingly, a high iron, which I think was a part of it uh, because I think the iron was a bit toxic. 
toxic to the mitochondria as well. So heavy metals in general are very toxic to mitochondria mm-hmm. function. So those are the things we worked on. You know, we worked on supporting the mitochondria more directly. We worked on lower, of course, working on sleep, working on, you know, exercise for him. It was actually doing less exercise. He was actually an avid runner and stop running. And I think, that, honestly, that's one of the things that maybe uh, also participated because, you know, exercise is a beautiful thing, but too much exercise can be detrimental yeah. because it creates a lot of buildup of, of toxic metabolites and things that the body maybe can't clear as easily. So what, what kind of diseases are low mitochondrial function found in? Yeah, so low mitochondrial function are found in many, many diseases. Um, in fact, I would venture to say most diseases. Mm-hmm. Um, you certainly see it in things like depression and mental health disorders. So basically anything that involves the nervous system is going to get affected because the nervous system has a very, very high concentration of mitochondria because you need mitochondria to open and close the little channels that carry um, basically ions in and out of nerve cells that allow the conduction to move. Mm -hmm. So when the mitochondria isn't healthy, then you're not making enough energy to do that, and then the the nervous system just doesn't do well. So if you have a predisposition to depression, you'll see it there. If you have a predisposition to anxiety, you'll see that show up. And the same thing with bipolar, same thing with autism, the same thing with obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, there's many, many research papers on each of these conditions showing how mitochondrial dysfunction has a relationship to them. Um, and then, you know, beyond those kinds of conditions that are more mental health, then even in other uh, neurodegenerative conditions, things like Alzheimer's, things like Parkinson's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis can play a role. Um, inflammatory conditions, you'll see it in like things like autoimmune conditions because there's a strong relationship between mitochondria breaking down and a lot of inflammation in the body. Um, So you'll see it there. Um, Really, almost any condition known, uh, heart disease, cancer, um, any major disease has a a mitochondrial component because the mitochondria are so essential to the cell. And when they're not working well and and it's breaking down and the cells are breaking down, it's going to predispose that person to all these conditions. So the mitochondria aren't working well. They're creating too much, too many free radicals and too much junk in the cell, uh, and they're they're not building up their resources properly or getting enough nutrients to create ATP, and that's leading to most of these disorders. Yeah, I mean that's correct. You know, it's interesting because uh, as I'm doing research on uh, what they call reactive oxygen species or oxidants, what we're learning is that oxidants might actually be a reaction the body has to help clear things out. And then in small amounts, they actually might be good. But as the process continues, as people get too many toxins, as there's too much inflammation, um, then it actually builds up too much to the point where the system can't handle it anymore and then things break down even further. Um, But yeah, generally that's true. I mean, things like high blood sugar and too much insulin around will contribute um, too much inflammation, uh, toxins in the environment, um, heavy metals will contribute as well. Um, So all of these things will create more breakdown in the body. Um, When we eat a, a lot of fats, that fat gets oxidized in the bloodstream, and that oxidation will also contribute to more mitochondrial dysfunction. I want to stop you there. What, what's your yeah. opinion on fat? Because there's uh, the whole low fat or high fat, low carb diet, the ketosis, which is using yeah. a uh, another source for energy instead of using right. glucose as energy. Sure. And, and, you know, everything, there's a pendulum, you know, and, and things keep swinging back and forth. People would say that, oh, high fat um, was terrible and now high fat is good. And, you know, so it, things keep going back and forth. If, you know, in my opinion, if you really look at things, um, it's really about the person and about the timing. So a lot of people who, let's say, are taking in way too many carbs or are putting away a lot of fat or their insulin is going up, their blood sugars are going up, maybe for the short term they might do well on more of a paleo-style diet or a higher fat diet, very, very low carb from a therapeutic value. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember when you do that, when you increase ketosis, when you increase lactic acid, 
when you increase breakdown of fatty acids in the blood, which is called beta oxidation, it's also going to destroy mitochondria in the process. So if you do it for too long, you might fix one problem, but create another. You know, if you look at um, the research from around the world about who's living the longest, um, and, you know, let's say the blue zone diet kind of um, information that's out there. What, you, what we're really seeing is the people who are living the longest and the healthiest uh, don't really restrict carbohydrates to that point, that they actually eat a fair amount of carbohydrates. They're very whole food based. And these people also, um, they also move their bodies often. They have a really good, strong sense of community. They tend to eat whole foods, uh, but they don't restrict the carbs. In fact, they don't really have a ton of fat and a ton of meat. You know, they have some, but it's not a lot. So, um, like so the, at least the Okinawa. Um, exactly, exactly. Like Okinawa, uh, places in Sardinia, um, Loma Linda, California, um, those places, yeah, what are considered the blue zone places. There's an area in Greece as well. And really, if you look at their diets, they don't follow a paleo, high fat, you know, ketotic diet. They, they're much, it's much more balanced. And, and to me, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, so, from what I've seen from their diet, it's mostly high in uh, insoluble fibers. Exactly. Uh, looking like it's it's increasing short chain fatty acids um, mm -hmm. instead of creating ketones, which is another short chain fatty acids, but uh, fatty acid. But it's uh, doing it via your your gut, your gut biome. Exactly right, and it just seems like the body has a lot more control there, and it creates a lot less inflammation in the process. Yeah. So so I do think um, you know I remember when. Um, when I was a student, probably about 17 years ago, I had the opportunity to do a little internship at the Atkins Center when uh, Robert Atkins was still alive. And, um, and, you know, and he put people on very severe, strict diets, but he did it for a therapeutic standpoint and then gradually moved them back to, you know, more vegetables, some more carbs for the long term. So I do think these, you know, these diets definitely have a therapeutic advantage, especially when you're trying to rebalance people who are very out of balance. Mm -hmm. But I think as a long term plan, um, I think some people really get kind of stuck in this idea. And I think it might not be healthy for their bodies. Yeah, I totally agree. So back to mitochondria and mood disorders, um, people with bipolar, why, why does lithium help? Does that is that enhancing uh is that enhancing the mitochondria sure well lithium has been shown to have some mitochondrial enhancing properties and it also helps uh kind of um regenerate the the gaba system in the brain you know the, uh, the mitochondria has benzodiazepine receptors so it has receptors for gaba which is a very calming neurotransmitter in the brain. So people who have bipolarity, um, you know, especially when they get into that manic state, um, having enhanced GABA can be really, really helpful. Um, so lithium does serve that purpose and really and does support the mitochondria in the process. That makes sense. Yeah, GABA is definitely important. Uh, and depression. So. A lot of studies have been linked to depression and increased inflammation in mostly the hypothalamus and the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. um, do antidepressants from your studies increase? Do, do you know if antidepressants help mitochondria, mitochondrial function? That's a really good question. As far as I know, um, antidepressants don't have a support for mitochondria. They may have some anti-inflammatory activity, mm -hmm. um, but my understanding is that in the long term, antidepressants tend to be more of a toxin to the system. Mm -hmm. um, so again, even in you know in situations where, the, let's say for depression, for example, uh, antidepressants are shown to help about 30% of the time, yeah. which is, by the way, not much more than placebo. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in the right patient, it, it can help, right? Even though it's not that high a percentage, there are some people who are certainly helped. Um, and, and for those people, you know, it may make sense, especially if they're in an urgent care situation and not in a safe place that, and they take them and they feel better, that's great. But for me, as a naturopathic doctor, I feel that's the opportunity to have them start working on their foods and on their sleep rituals and on their stressors and on their digestion and, and all the things that, you know, help 
create a healthier mitochondria. So this way, they can get to the point where they can safely wean off that medication and not have to go back on it and actually fix the problem. Because the problem with antidepressants in the long term is even when they do help, they tend to burn the system out at the same time. And when you think about it, you know, the, uh, the antidepressants kind of use up uh, the system, but don't put anything back. So, um, so the, the important thing is to say, okay, well, you know what, if it's helping in this case, that's fine, but let's work on the underlying causes now that this person is feeling better. And I think that's where psychiatry misses, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They just look for the mood specifically. So what, what, what is hurting mitochondria? What in our environment are hurting mitochondria? We have toxins, but what kind of toxins? What's, what's going on with the gut? What, what kind of, yeah. uh, what kind of medications hurt it? What's what's going on there? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, there's multiple factors. I think the first factor is that um, most of us don't get enough sleep. Mm-hmm. And and that's when, the, that's when the body regenerates and the mitochondria regenerate themselves. That's when they break down. Mitophagy? Get, what's that? Mitophagy? Uh, mitophagy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's what happens. Mitophagy means they kind of break down, they clean up, um, they get eaten by the cell, and they make and you make new mitochondria. Um, so we're, most of us aren't getting enough sleep, and if you're not getting enough sleep, you don't have enough time for that process uh, because the body has to be powered down to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is exercise. You know, exercise is interesting because you use your mitochondria to create more energy for exercise, but when and you that's stop that, that's in a hormetic process, right? That is a hormetic process. Yeah. So that's a great term. So hormesis basically means, um, you know, that a little bit of something can can hurt the system to basically help it. So exercise is a perfect example because when you exercise, you break tissue down, hopefully in small amounts, and then the body responds. By, by strengthening things and fixing them and making more mitochondria. So in the long term, while exercise is a bit of a stressor, in the long term, it actually strengthens the body. The problem with exercise, like anything else, if you do too much of it, then it can overwhelm the system and the system can't recover. And that's why, you know, there's an interesting study from the University of Copenhagen that came out a few years ago. And what it showed was that People who, who jog mild to moderate amounts, maybe like a half hour to 45 minutes an hour tops three times a week and not too fast a pace, you know, had longer life expectancy, uh, about 5.3 years for women and 6.1 for men. Oh, wow. But they think that, that people who exercised uh, pretty significantly and severely and were doing a lot more mileage, a lot faster paces, actually didn't live as long. So, like, exercising twice a day would be bad? Well, it, you know... this theory... Yeah, I mean, it depends on how hard you're exercising, right? I mean, if you're if you're using your body past its capacity to heal and regenerate, and you're producing more things like lactic acid at a rate faster than the body can clean it up, then yeah, it's it's actually going to do more harm than good. That makes sense. So everything's so about if, if you can handle it, then it's fine. Yeah, I mean, but that problem is sometimes people, you know, we all can get obsessed about things. So what we think we can handle and what actually our body can handle are different. You know, that's why it's good to talk to your doc and, and see what your doc thinks, uh, you know, and checking your body out and checking your blood and, and really seeing what's going on to help make the best decisions. You know, and everybody's different. You know, some people, um, vigorous exercise is very healthy and will help them regenerate. Some people need to stick more to kind of Tai Chi and yoga, and that's, you know, best for them. So, Yeah, I've, I've looked into a few of my genes uh, and a few different SNPs are, uh, m- make it easier for my body. I'm predispos- predisposed to uh, be better at short bursts rather than long endurance kind of like marathon training i'm I'm better at like a uh, quick hit and things like that yeah you're more fast twitch right fast and i'm twitch. I'm definitely more so, slow twitch yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew long before uh, genetic uh tests were checking that stuff out yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah you just get to know <laughs> so people aren't exercising enough to allow their mitochondria to build themselves up and they're not uh sleeping enough to allow the mitochondria to recycle. What else is going on that's hurting mitochondria? Exactly. Well, a lot of us eat a very nutrient-deficient uh, diet. 
you know. Um, unfortunately, the foods that are around us are pretty nutrient deficient. Um, when you look at the pathways of the mitochondria, there's, you know, all all those vitamins are involved as cofactors, all the B vitamins and um, so and magnesium and zinc so and all this let's, stuff. Let's talk about one specific uh, or uh, enzyme off of mm -hmm. uh, the B vitamins. You've got NAD. Mm -hmm. What's happening yeah. there? Why is that such a big deal? What what process is that involved in? Sure. NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically a coenzyme that's in all our cells. Um, and what it does is it shuttles electrons around. And there's early parts of how our body makes energy called glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, which is where our you know, where we generate this NAD and, and basically as something called NADH. And it goes to another part of the mitochondria that has something called the electron transport chain, which is actually the part that makes the energy. And we need to make those NADs into NADHs so that it can redonate that last H to help create the energy. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have enough of it around, and niacin, like you said, nicotinamide, is a, it's a type of niacin, mm -hmm. is a part of that. And when we don't have enough of it around, what tends to happen is that um, the mitochondria will suffer. And when we're sick, a lot of times cells are breaking down and, and genetic material breaks down. And when genetic material breaks down, when the cells aren't healthy, we, we end up using a lot of those B vitamins that we need to make the nicotinamide adenide, uh, adenine dinucleotide as well. So, um, so in the cases when we're sick, we actually need even more of it just to kind of keep the system going because the, the body's using it not just to make energy, but also to try to fix our genetic material so that it doesn't cause other problems. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got NAD depletion. Uh, you've got to toxins. You've got uh, problems with sleep, uh, not getting enough hormesis, uh, not enough nutrients, but that's part of NAD. Uh, what kind of medications are, are, are toxic to mitochondria? Well, I tell you, the, the list is, is very, very long, and I would venture to say most, if not all, medications. <laughs> okay, wow. So it's uh, yeah, I mean it's um, you know these 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 are chemicals and chemicals have to get processed through the body and they and they break down to other harmful chemicals that are poisonous to our mitochondria. You know, so for example, we talked about bipolar disorder. You know, the different drugs that are used for bipolar, you know, help might help a person's symptoms, but unfortunately, it also damages the mitochondria, which in the long term will cause more symptoms. So, um, you know, so for instance, when I work with people who who are dealing with that and, ha and are taking medications, which admittedly sometimes can be very helpful to them in, in situations where other things aren't, um, you know, I think it's really important to work on all these basics to see if there's a possibility of even lowering the medication or at least trying to get them on the lowest dose that helps that you know will help them so this way we reduce the toxicity while at the same time giving them things that support and feed their mitochondria so that there aren't longer term problems with it yeah i agree what about uh things like uh since since mitochondria are, are based they're essentially uh bacteria what about antibiotics you know, that's a really good question. Um, and I have to say, I don't really have an answer for that. I think at one point, they were separate uh, bacteria that kind of went into our cells. Uh, I don't know if they have the same vulnerability from an antibiotic. I know antibiotics, as a general rule, are pretty toxic, though, and will probably have the same. Yeah, I know uh, certain, certain molds. But that's something I have to have to look up and look up. Yeah, I know certain uh, toxins and molds. Uh, mm -hmm where we derive things like penicillin from are actually toxic to mitochondria. Um, but I, I don't know about all the, all the antibiotics, some, some beta lactam antibiotics are, are bad, but mm -hmm. I don't know about all of them. Yeah. I don't, I don't honestly know that either. It'd be a great little research project. I think that may be my next uh, project now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Um, so how does someone tell if they have mitochondrial dif dysfunction? What's, what are, what are some things they can look at? Well, I would say the first thing to think about is um, is if, if somebody has a chronic condition that that a doc just can't figure out, you know, mm -hmm. like they're just 
maybe they're just tired all the time, their mood is poor, um, they have these low-grade inflammatory issues, they have you know blood sugar dysregulation, uh, gut problems which they feel they just can't solve. Um, you know, I remember seeing another patient who, uh, who came in and was treated by the last holistic person he had seen, and he had seen some good people, um, you know, and they put him on this candida cleanse, you know, because they said, oh, you have candida. You know, we got to clean that up. And, and they put him on it, and it actually made him worse, you know. And he felt even worse. And uh, before he came in to see me, and, and we looked at this and, and found, you know, evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, so it, it, it's basically, uh, you know, in one way, you can think about it, especially when all other things are ruled out, you know. You know, you've tried to work on the gut. You've tried to work on your sleep, but you're still not sleeping, um, you know, and it just seems to have sometimes no rhyme or reason to it. Um, I've seen a lot of patients who I think uh, younger in my practice, I would have diagnosed more as adrenal fatigued. Um, but now that I'm looking into this, I'm realizing there's an underlying cause to the adrenal fatigue, the same way there's an underlying cause to the gut dismotility and the gut not moving properly, Yeah, you know. So, um, so I, I would say for, for, pay, for people out there who are suffering and have seen a number of doctors and still haven't gotten an answer, um, that this is definitely something to think about. And, you know, and, and, and the nice thing about working on these things is that, um, at the, you know, you can't really hurt anything by working on this, you know, because it, it's only things that are healthy to the body. Yeah, so. yeah the more energy you can have, the better your cells are going to do. Right, Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I just looked up uh, something about um, antibiotics and mitochondrial dysfunction, and there are actually a number of papers about it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing some research on it, uh, yeah. but I haven't, I haven't published anything on the, the blog yet. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It doesn't surprise me, of course, because all these medications definitely are, are toxins. So, uh, yeah. um, so, so these widely used antibiotics are definitely uh, going to affect the mitochondria. Yeah, I've been trying to look into see if uh, mitochondria, like bacteria, can create biofilms, but I've mm -hmm. yet to find uh, hard evidence to prove that. Just interesting. Theories. Yeah, <laughs> I like. That. Um, so, what what are some labs people can look at for their mitochondria? Well, there there are a number of them. I'd say the the ones that are easiest for. Uh, people to ask their doctors for are uh, lactic acid, uh, pyruvic acid. Um, you know, uh, I, I also like them to look at uh, coenzyme Q10. Mm -hmm. I would say those would be the top three that I would look at. Um, uh, I think they'll give you an idea. You know, unfortunately, it's not perfect. Uh, the only thing that's um, probably considered the gold standard is a muscle biopsy. Um, and then there are some places that have more advanced testing. There's something called the ATP panel, which they look at the ratios of how much energy you're making to how much energy basically you're not making. Um, so there's there's a few panels out there, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, and I think it's a field that's still evolving. So I'm not sure it's, it's clear we have the best. Um, laboratory tests, uh, you know, I'd love to say, hey, you know, just go get this test, find out if you have it, find out if you don't. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting because I know with food allergy testing, it's kind of the same thing. A lot of people have ideas about using food allergy testing, but uh, I'm not... so quickly. Yeah, and I'm not really sure there's one test that's, that's really ideal for everyone and that's 100%. I wish there were. I would use it all the time. And I, and I think it's the same thing with mitochondrial function. I, you know, you try to run a number of different tests and you kind of look at them together. Um, I also like to look at the MTHFR gene. Um, I like to look at uh, something called the alanine to lysine ratio. Um, because it looks at that kind of looks at uh, certain accumulations of certain things that build up when the mitochondria aren't working well. Yeah, you Carn know, what hyperalanemia, right? Alanemia. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Al alanemia, right? Exactly. And then there's um, carnitine um, can be an issue as well. Uh, sometimes it's very low when things are depleted, or it's very very high when the mitochondria are breaking down. Um, we talked about iron before. So, um, you know, and all, and, uh, and all of them, you know, gives you clues. I wouldn't say there's one test that 
you know, can clearly define anything. But I think when you look at a patient's history and see their symptoms, and then you look at the tests, you can get a pretty good idea. You've got um, all these tests here. And if someone finds out that they have mitochondrial dysfunction or just wants to enhance their mitochondria, what can they do? Well, I mean, the first thing is to try to, you know, look at their life and see where toxins can be removed. You know, so toxins are a big problem and they'll keep the situation going. So getting rid of, of course, what are lifestyle toxins other than heavy metals. Um, certainly alcohol, cigarettes, uh, too much exercise, um, amalgams in people's mouths, uh, cosmetics, pesticides. You know, right now it's springtime in New York and, and I see all the gardeners throwing all this stuff on the lawns and, and, you know, bringing down all the pesticide to get rid of the dandelions. And, you know, the first thing I think about is, well, dandelion is such a good herb for the liver. Why would you kill them when you could just pick yeah. them and make a salad out of them? <laughs> and then secondly, you know, all these pesticides are, are killing us. And, and, they, and actually there's, you know, there's studies that show that lawns, you know, in, children, in homes where children live um, have higher rates of mitochondrial dysfunction, leukemia, all these things. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of places we can look around and say, you know, what we can get rid of this. We don't need this around and it's not good for us. Um, the second thing is to bring in the things that are good for us, you know, mm -hmm. and the foods that are healthy, um, uh, you know, foods, first of all, that we're not allergic to. So we're not creating more inflammation, which will damage mitochondria, um, eating things high in malic acid and citric acid like apples, kombucha, Helps um, that cycle. Yeah, if people's carnitine is low, like extra meat and fish might be really helpful for them. Uh, berries, green tea, uh, rose, rosemary, thyme, all of these things are phytonutrient rich, control oxidative damage. Um, and, then, and then, of course, getting rid of foods, things like corn syrup. Um, I have some people who I put on calorie restriction diets and intermittent fasting. So this way, their, their mitochondria has time to fix itself. Um, yeah, but if corn syrup's glucose, what's the problem with that? Well, uh, corn syrup is usually high fructose. Yeah. It's usually high fructose. Yeah. Well, even whether it's glucose or fructose, if there's too much, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you hyperglycemic. It's going to spike mm -hmm. insulin. And insulin exactly. is, is a contributor to uh, creating what's called superoxides, um, which will damage mitochondria further. So, yeah. So it's just... Um, you know, again, you need some, but too much is not good. You know, water is, in, is an interesting molecule because too little water and you die of t dehydration. Too much water and you drown, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's still, even water has got to be the right amount <laughs> so, <laughs> of everything. Yeah, uh, the dose is the poison. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then we talked about sleep. Sleep is critical. Uh, exercise. And, 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 you know, what the studies are showing is that there's a – a balance with exercise that um, uh, doing both uh, aerobic and aerobic, you know, so building your muscles and doing cardio um, can help better than just doing one or the other mm -hmm. and certainly doing the right amount, not too much or too little. So you met, you mentioned some uh, herbs. What, what are some supplements that, that help? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I start with the basics, uh, things like uh, fish oil and magnesium. Fish oils is important to, stabilize membranes magnesium uh stabilizes atp and displaces heavy metals um the b vitamins are critical um because it's their cofactors and all the electron chain complexes um and then depending on the patient there are other things i might consider using glutathione is one of them glutathione is one of the, uh, the master antioxidants of the body um so if patients are seem to be low in glutathione, especially if their homocysteine is high, that's another lab we didn't talk about. Uh, but homocysteine is an inflammatory marker, and typically when that's high, people's glutathione can be on the low side. So supporting them with that. Um, that can, so, uh, that can uh, show a methylation problem. Exactly, exactly. And um, things like N-acetylcysteine can be useful to lysine, um, which is also very calming to the brain at the same time. Um, again, coenzyme Q10 is pretty straightforward because um, coenzyme Q10 is needed for the electron transport chain. Um, lipoic acid 
has been shown to be very helpful. Um, there are studies that show with uh, people, uh, men who have exercised over a couple of weeks, that their their blood antioxidant capacity goes way up when you um, you know in, increase their lipoic acid. Yeah, it recycles uh, antioxidants, right? Exactly, and it's also great for blood sugar, so it helps balance the hyperglycemia. Um, and then things like creatine, uh, creatine can also be very useful. Um, it provides the cells with energy because uh, it gets it helps uh, the conversion to ATP. Um, and you know most bodybuilders take creatine, and that's one of the reasons. And it, it's it seems to be quite safe for most people. Um, and it, and it also reduces lactic acid buildup, so the mitochondria uh, are a little less uh, under siege. Um, and brand yeah, that makes sense to uh, to take it before working out. Or while working out, it's reducing lactic acid. Yep. Yeah, and along with uh, branched chain amino acids, uh, those can be helpful as well. Um, just a very absorbable way to get amino acids in, um, and it also it, it, they directly feed um, a part of the glycolysis pathway um, called acetyl CoA, which is uh, an important part of moving into your Krebs cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's just a nice, easy way. Like if you put people on a, on a more stricter diet and then you give them things like branched chain amino acids, it still helps the cycle stay nourished and working without giving them their calories. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. Any, uh, probiotics? Well, absolutely. You know, as a basic, I always recommend people do a good multiple vitamin, a good fish oil and a good probiotic. Um, specifically, probiotics can be helpful because they'll help the gut microbiome. And when you have a stronger gut microbiome, you're also going to decrease uh, D-lactate levels in the body yeah. uh, by, by decreasing the fermentation going on down there. So, it's, um, so yeah, absolutely, probiotics are, can be a big point of it, as, you know, as well as good digestive health in general. So if you had one thing that someone could do to increase their mitochondrial function, that they can make one lifestyle change today, what would it yeah. be? Um, if I had to pick one, I'd start with sleep. Good choice. Um, because, yeah, because it's the body can't do it without enough sleep. You know, you can give it all the nutrients it needs, and but it really needs the sleep to to make that happen. So um, I know for me, you know, my life sometimes not everything can get done. You know, I like to meditate, I like to exercise, I like to prepare my foods and eat well, and I think about sleep. And if I have to prioritize because I can't get them all done, I make sure I get to sleep. Because I just find uh, without that, the other ones are, are not as fun. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about infrared for increasing mitochondrial function? Yeah, well, infrared is, is beautiful because it increases circulation, you know, wherever. And, and circulation will help that. So absolutely. I mean, it gets nutrients to areas that aren't very well nutrified. Um, you know, I, I'm also a licensed acupuncturist as well as an, as a naturopathic doctor. And so when I do acupuncture on patients, I'll always do infrared on, on spots and their body, it's usually their digestion, the digestive air, um, to help that process there. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. And if anyone wants any more information, uh, my website is, uh, www.innersourcehealth.com. That's, uh, I N N E R. S O U R C E health dot com, and uh, my last book it was is called Put Anxiety Behind You, uh, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and and it basically goes through all the things we talked about uh, specifically for anxiety, and I, I know it's helped a lot of people, and um, you know, and having had it myself, I, I just know that. Um, you know, for people out there who are, aren't doing well and feel they can't get help, I just want them to know that there are a lot of things that can be done and natural medicines can actually be a very powerful way to help fix the problem. So there is, you know, still things to do. So, and so, and I also want to thank you, Jacob, for what you're doing um, with the, um, you know, with this work and, and getting the word out to people about uh, natural medicine and how they can help themselves. And so that's um, really important. So, we value that. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for coming on to the podcast. And both those links, uh, both links to those, um, his website and his book will be in the description below so you can easily access it. All right. Well, thank you All so right, much. It's a pleasure. Enjoy the day and uh, happy spring. Thanks. You too.